Thank you very much, Deepak, and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for giving up your time on a Saturday for us to discuss these things. Um, uh, to start off with, um, we've, uh, as Deepak said, welcome to 2021. Um, but 2020 was a, an awful year <laughs> for many reasons and for many people. Um, and that's going to be kind of the theme of what we're talking about. And I'm sure everyone knows someone who has been affected or some family. Um, a number of friends of mine um, passed away because of COVID over the year. And I, I fell victim to it myself at one stage and it's not a, it's not a pretty um, story. Um, but it's also uh, it's a big thing for employment, for business, for politics. Um, it's a big issue in terms of society in general and uh, communities and families and individuals. And it, it affects us all in different ways. And some of us have taken the opportunity to go all Joe Wick and get up and exercise and that, but the um, medicos that I talk to tell me that people are putting on a lot more weight. So um, that's not taking off as much as some would like. Um, so, uh, but the, the bigger issue is that these lockdowns lead to isolation for a lot of people. And it could be isolation um, with a family uh, or friends, or it could be isolation where you have no, no one. Uh, I know quite a number of people, and I'm sure you all do know some people who are just absolutely isolated, particularly older people, um, which is very tragic. Um, and it has been difficult. I don't know if any of you have attended funerals over this period. It's very sad to attend a funeral. I've, I've attended a number in person. I've been the, the priest at the funeral. And there's in the beginning of lockdown, March, April, May, it was um, 10 people were allowed and they would stream it. The streaming was excellent in all the funeral um, uh, facilities I went to. And there would be, in some cases, hundreds of people uh, on the streaming. And, and I, I was one of those people on certain occasions. But it's very, very difficult to see family members isolated in the same room, not being able to hug each other at a time like that. That's, that's there, there's real um, difficulty. And then people, um, gravely sick or even dying alone without anyone in their family in attendance. And again, that seems very unnatural uh, and difficult to deal with. So this isolation has led to real anxiety and stress for people, a real strain, sometimes in relationships, sometimes in families, certainly on a community level. It got to the stage, of course, where before Christmas, if Christmas had been banned due to lockdown, there would have been some form of riot, the, the storming of, of uh, Downing Street, like the storming of the Capitol, maybe for a more righteous reason. But it was a real feeling that people were just fed up. How long can you put up with this? Uh, be, and it's mainly because of uh, our mental anxieties. Um, it's just unnatural for us to be separated from others. Um, it's very, very difficult for us to deal with. So today, um, we would, I would like to, and so uh, um, just to mention that Ramesh Patni has addressed you before on this issue, which was great, um, and looking at it from a philosophical perspective. So how do we deal with these issues psychologically, philosophically? And I, I just like to compliment what um, Ramesh has done by sharing uh, three stories and um, we, we could ask, well, what's, what's the point of a story? Uh, story is just a, a blah, blah. <laughs> what's the relevance of it? And you read these scriptural stories and because they're from the Mahabharata, the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Harivamsa. So three very different sources. But when you read these stories, they seem fairly mythical and they're full of flying monsters, but also, of course, full of all the soap opera of romance and intrigue and battles and, and family dispute and, and all, all that goes on in the world. So uh, why, we might as well just get a box set and watch that do a Netflix. It's just, just the same. Uh, and maybe to some extent, because it's the um, Indian uh, 
thought has always recognized, has always spoken in stories, because it recognizes that life is a story. Our life is one story, and our life is a sequence of stories put together to create that one story. So every moment of our life is a different story. And we'll go down to the shop and we'll come back and we'll tell the story of that little journey down to the shop. We'll go to a wedding and we'll come back and tell the story of that wonderful, joyous occasion. We'll go to a funeral and come back and talk about the sadness that we experienced. So the story is joyous, it's distressed, it's full of success, it's full of failure at different times. There's different stories going on in our life. It's not one thing. Um, so, but stories shape our lives because we remember certain, certain instances make impressions on our mind that we continually come back to, to meditate on a certain story. And these stories are um, constructed specifically for med meditation. They bring us in because of the human interest because of the human condition that's being discussed. But it's actually trying to get us to meditate on something more profound, something more substantial. So the story is only um, a carrier, shall we say. It's only a catalyst to connect us with different ways of thinking. Um, and yes, so it's, it's kind of, when we talk about mindfulness, which is an, um, distilled from Indian meditation techniques. And the idea of mindfulness is that we stop and we just observe. We observe the distress, we observe the happiness, we observe everything that's in between, and we don't pass judgment on it, we just see it as it goes by. But mindfulness in an Indian sense also includes filling the mind. It's not simply passive, it's also active. It's also how do you fill the mind with something worth thinking about? So it's not mindfulness, shouldn't be mindlessness. Uh, we should actually engage with the mind and, and learn how to use the mind um, appropriately. And Dr. Modi, one of our um, regulars in, in the Friends, um, contacted me, or so contacted someone who contacted me in discussing this talk and just suggested also something, I'm sure he might be embarrassed that I'm sharing it with everyone, but I thought it was a good point that he made, that the locked, locked down uh, from another perspective, stories aside, but the story of our life, uh, we are locked down in our karma and we're bound to it. We're bound to our body, we're bound to our mind. So our whole life is um, a sequence of lockdowns. And it's how to get free from that sense of being locked down to be more expansive, uh, that these forms of meditation help. Warmer now? I'm warmer. No, I, I think he, he just probably got a message from somewhere and he's forwarded it on. Yeah. Wish I wouldn't have organized it for more noise, where would he? <laughs> but Bharat, we can hear you. Is it, is it Bharat we're talking to? No? Okay. Um, so the first story, now, um, as uh, Deepak said, there are these stories for lockdown, I don't know if you can see, oh, it's back to front, beg your pardon, three stories for lockdown, it's a little, these are three stories that Anuradha, who a lot of you know from giving talks, um, when lockdown happened, she just, for her own personal amusement, um, wrote three stories uh, repurposed, retold three stories from the Ramayana, the Mahabharata and the Harivamsha. And um, I saw these stories and I cobbled them together into a little thing and I'm basing the talk on that. So she might be, uh, Dr. Modi might be embarrassed and Anurad is definitely embarrassed, um, but uh, she gave permission. So um, the first story I'd like to share is the story of Sita. Um, uh, specifically Sita in the garden from the Ramayana. Now, you know the story. Sita was kidnapped. She was in the forest. In the forest, she was already in isolation. As Anuradha explains in her story, how she puts it is that Ram lost his job. Uh, very, a very lockdown situation, <laughs> a very COVID, COVID situation. I've never heard Ram being exiled to the forest being described as he lost his job before, but there you go. Um, so um, he lost his job and they had to move and they moved to the forest, but they were isolated from society. 
but she went into another form of isolation where she was taken from the shelter of her husband and her brother-in-law who she was with, taken by Ravana and put into a garden. Uh, and it describes that garden as an extremely beautiful place, but Sita wasn't engaged with it at all. Uh, she was in a terrible uh, condition of being absolutely separate from her surroundings and having no shelter. So I'll read you just um, a section of this. Um, this is her situation. At the foot of this great tree, a great tree in the garden, Princess Sita sat on the ground, disheveled and dirty, moved by her glorious and glit unmoved, sorry, by her glorious and glittering surroundings. Her dark fawn-like eyes brimmed with tears and her fragile form gaunt from fasting, heaved with deep sorrowful sighs. Her downcast face and dejected appearance contrasted starkly with her picture perfect surroundings. No earthly splendor could compensate for separation from Ram. She felt discontented and distant from everything around her and had never felt more isolated and alone. What joy was her Sorry, what joy was there in life without Ram? What was the point of any life without him? In her heart, however, Sita clung to the hope of being reunited with Ram once again. Further details of the prince's plight reveal she was not, however, in complete isolation. It might have been more bearable had she been. Surrounded, surrounding her on all sides were many hideous female creatures these were night stalkers, rakshasas, a race of violent and bloodthirsty beings who took delight in harassing the virtuous souls who challenged their ghastly conduct. That's the first, first little reading about her situation. So it was, it was worse than isolation. She was surrounded by these rakshasas who were taunting her constantly. And their taunts were... Um, hmm. Oops, I had some notes. Here they are, yes. Um, she was confined and isolated, uncertain, threatened, no friends or support, very much like anyone in, iso in isolation. She was in a mental isolation as well because there were people around her, but she couldn't relate to them. In fact, she was threatened exactly by them. Um, she felt alone and hopeless. And these... Rakshasas, they were monsters in every sense of the term, but we also have to some degree Rakshasas, mental monsters, who are telling us that there is no hope for the future. That's one of the things the Rakshasas said to her. In fact, I'll just read some of the things they said and think of how our anxious mind also repeats these mantras. You have no hope for the future, you are doomed. Um, Anuradha puts in here just as a little addendum. This is bad, bad, very bad, very bad. Anyway, <laughs> it's just, I just heard a, a certain voice in that. Um, this, uh, this is it for you now. Nobody loves you. No one ever could love you. No one will love you. What, what are you going to do with everything taken away? You will never be happy again. You're never getting out of this. You're on your own. And it's going to be bad, very bad. <laughs> so it's totally negative. They're trying to break her down and break her down. And when I say mental rakshasas, that's exactly the circumstance that we find ourselves in with mental uh, rakshas, negative mental energy. And when we're isolated, this, these thoughts can play on us. And, uh, and bring us down. And these are the thoughts of stress and anxiety and depression. And, and they're absolutely classic. And it's interesting to see them in this context. And generally, when we think of Sita, we don't think of what she had to go through in the garden. We don't think of it in terms of depression and anxiety. We think Sita, the goddess of fortune, the wife of Ram, everything's going to be okay. Everything's per pure and perfect. But actually, no, she was going through real difficulty. Um, and the, the second reading is a little longer. So in the garden, so um, 
Sita was comforted by a friendly Rakshasa. Now this is extraordinary, a friendly Rakshasa. Uh, who, who would have thought? Trijata, who did not conform to type. Like an antidote to her kinfolk's venomous harassment, she tried to stop their hurtful taunts and lift Sita from her despair. Trijata warned her kinswomen of the consequences of their behavior. She did this by sharing a dream she had of Ram and Sita's reunion and the destruction of the city of Lanka. She, must, she said to Sita, she must not lose sight of hope. A bird in a tree sitting in his nest repeatedly poured forth sweet melodies in joyful, full trothed song. It seemed, Trijata said, to be singing warm, comforting notes, especially to encourage Sita. This lockdown would not last. Ram would find her. She would be free and, there would be, and they would be together again. Uplifted by Trijata's kind words, Sita wrapped her mind in thoughts of Ram, and as she did, auspicious omens increased and inspired her with courage. The confinement in Ravana's wall garden could not crush her spirit. Her tormentor's cruel jibes would not touch her. With heart and mind fixed on Ram, her grief lifted and her sorrow was dispelled. Joy rose again in her heart and her face once more became radiant and bright. These days of distance and isolation would soon pass. There could be no separation from Ram. Her trial had not weakened their bond. She was as inseparable from Ram as radiance is from the sun. The clouds at last were beginning to clear. The dark days of her separation were coming to an end. And if we analyze that, lovely story, lovely story within a story of the Ramayan. So Trijata didn't conform to type. She was a Rakshasa, yet she had kindness in her heart. And she reached out against the norm and against her friends um, to show that kindness to someone. Um, yes. Um, and so when she did that, uh, she didn't follow the crowd. Now, Sita also didn't follow the crowd because Sita was in mental anxiety and a little bit of meltdown. Her, her options in life were becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. Her anxiety was making it seem like nothing was worth it. And more than anything, she wasn't worth it. She couldn't be with Ram. What's the point? What's the point of life? Um, and it's, it's interesting how many time, how many references there are to people in the Ramayana contemplating suicide because life isn't worth living. And um, it's again, showing anxiety is a real thing. Mental health is a real thing. It affects people in real ways. Um, and even though we desire herd immunity, we don't desire herd mentality. So the fact that Trijata could step out of the herd and do something extraordinary. The fact that Sita could step out of her mind, the way her mind was with her mental rakshasas like a herd assailing her, but she could step away from it. That's what gives us hope because Trijata um, showed us that a little act of kindness can touch someone's heart and change their whole demeanor, their whole outlook on life. But Sita accepted the kindness, and that's the other half of the equation. This is what we call a relationship. <laughs> There's always two sides to it. And what's very difficult to do when we're in anxiety, it's very difficult to accept when someone comes forward to us to be kind. It's very difficult to accept that they're being true, that they're actually being kind. We don't, we don't expect kindness. To the extent we don't expect it, we can't receive it even when it's offered. So both Trijata stepped out of the herd and also Sita stepped out of the herd of her own mind so that they could book the trend and do something extraordinary. Give kindness and also receive kindness. And that, that's an element of mental health that's very important for us to understand because um, people who are suffering from anxiety or depression uh, it is very difficult for them to accept kindness when it's offered without suspecting it, without being threatened by it. Uh, it's just another threat, another difficulty to have to deal with. Um, 
And then the other issue is, as Trijata did very wonderfully, she pointed out to uh, Sita, listen to the birds. These birds are singing for you. This is beauty that you can accept and appreciate. Don't You don't even have to listen to me. Look at the beauty that's around you, you know, and that you do have something to hope for, you know, because the fact is Ram could come. So as long as the, the idea that Ram could come is there, that's totally positive and you can't reject it because it is a real possibility. And it's just, that's the kindness of being able to convince someone who's negative to just look and accept the possibility of the positive. Uh, so th these acts of kindness, and it's not something, um, it's interesting that when we're in difficulty, when we're in isolation and we have become negative or depressed or isolated, and I've, I've personally um, had to deal with an, a number of people in this condition during this time. I deal with myself on a daily basis when I look in the mirror in this regards. Um, but when, when we, uh, it, it's important to be kind, even though the issue is that we're the one who needs the kindness, according to our analysis. You know, so I, I need kindness, but there's nothing I can do about people being kind to me or not, but I can do something about me being kind to others. So that issue of serving first, not expecting someone to serve me. I, I have no control over that, but I can be kind to someone else, even though I may think I'm the one that's really in need here. I might be quite convinced about that, but still the only thing I can do that's positive is to give kindness to others, which is very easy to do. It's not difficult, but when you give it to others, you're also giving it to yourself. Any positive thought you give to someone else is something you have to consider. So it's, it's quite dynamic, the idea of serving others and serving others through kindness. And kindness is something you don't expect a result from. You just give it, it's always a small thing. It's always just a throwaway comment. It's always telling someone how good they are or appreciating them uh, in some real sense. So that's the first, um, first story. The second story is um, a well-known story. Um, Anuradha tells it very beautifully um, in an interesting way. It's, it's the story of the lifting of Govardhan Hill. Uh, I'll, I'll summarize it for those of you who aren't acquainted with it, but I think everyone, well, most people are. But um, uh, Govardhan Hill is in Braj and it's the land of Krishna. And um, uh, every year the cowherd community. Krishna lived in this beautiful community of, of cow herds, and they had big herds of cows wandering around the pasture ground, lands. The community was very peaceful, very connected, um, and uh, they all did a, a, an annual offering to Indra, the king of heaven, because Indra let the rains fall, and that made the grass grow, and that fed the cows, and they loved their cows. And they love milk and ghee and yogurt and all the things that come out of milk. So, so they thought every year this is just something that they did. No one remembered why. It just seems like the thing to do, uh, to be grateful for to the environment and the world around us. And then Krishna, rather mischievously, he was a seven-year-old child, yet he convinced everyone not to worship Indra, but to worship Govardhan Hill, this huge big hill. Because he said, actually, it's the hill that gives us everything. Because everything grows on the hill. The, the cows go and pasture on the hill. Uh, the, the water runs off the hill in the streams. So this is, this is where we get everything. So they decided to worship Govardhan Hill instead. And um, Indra got a bit annoyed, shall we say. So Indra uh, brings the Sambartika clouds. These are the clouds of destruction that when... The world is to be destroyed. These are the clouds that inundate the world and uh, just cause absolute mayhem, storms and tsunamis and uh, you name it. Uh, all those words, hurricanes, typhoons, whatever it is. So he, br he brought in those clouds, uh, complete overkill, and um, to, to, to inundate and absolutely annihilate these people as a warning to everybody. And Krishna, seven-year-old kid, picked up Govardhan Hill with a little finger 
of his left hand, which is considered to be the weakest digit on the body, and just lifted it above his head and invited everyone to come in and take shelter. And he stood there like that for seven days, laughing and joking with his friends. And everyone was locked down in the hill, but totally happy. And then um, Indra just ran out of puff and he surrendered and said, okay, you're obviously not just a seven-year-old kid. I know who you are. You're Krishna, my bad. Um, how can I serve you? So the whole thing became resolved. Um, and really the issue was uh, Krishna was, dealing, was helping Indra understand what pride is. And even though he's got an elevated position, if he's proud, he's going to destroy his position and a lot of other people as well. So that's that's the, the gist of the story. Anuradha writes the story in a very interesting way. She writes the story as, um, as if she was a calf um, in the herd. So it's an interesting, interesting angle. Um, so I'll, I'll read you um, one section here. So, so this is, yes, this is the calf explaining uh, what was happening. It all happened very quickly. When Indra heard his long-awaited offerings had been sent to Govardhan, a hill of all things, pride erupted within him. I couldn't understand what he said, but it must have been something like, don't you know who I am? How dare you not honor me? I'll show you ungrateful nobodies who's in charge. I guessed this because he got very red in the face and all puffed up and his teeth showed a lot. My mother, who understood everything, told me later that Indra said we would all pay for listening to that little pipsqueak Krishna who talked too much. And actually, that's a direct quote from the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, actually, is. He was furious about the change in tradition and being undermined publicly by a seven-year-old child. Then all hell broke loose. Indra's pride and pent-up resentment exploded into a violent storm. If ever there was an overreaction, this was it. He sent his wrath in enormous clouds of destruction and battered the village of Vrindavan with hailstorms, fearsome winds and torrents of rain. As the water rose and submerged the fields, the villagers ran for their lives. I panicked and broke free from my tether. The winds whipped up everything in their path and the darkness was frightening. My mother, terrified and shivering in the pelting rain and blasting wind, urged me to follow the herd as everyone ran to Krishna. Save us, the villagers cried. We cried. That was a cow, by the way. Krishna at this point smiled. He always sees what no one else can, has a plan and never simply accomplishes one thing by what he does. What followed the mayhem was no exception. How it all happened, we'll never know, but so wondrous was it that we still retell it today. So if you look at that, we see um, Indra's pride in full flow. And while we're in lockdown, so, so even someone as elevated, we would think as Indra um, loses it sometimes. We can all fall victim to pride anytime. I've seen, um, I've seen a five-year-old child be chastised for boasting pride. And that actually was me. <laughs> First time I understood what the word boasting was when a teacher chastised me for boasting. I was five years old. <laughs> um, but we can all get puffed up. And when we do, we can't see straight. And it causes destruction. It destroys relationships. Um, in this case, it's destroying the environment. Um, and it blights flourishing and well-being. So if we look at what are the causes for environmental destruction? What are the causes for economic distress? And behind it all, often we can see a small group of people who are very proud of their power or position uh, and mastering that over others. Um, and we always get annoyed when we see it and hopefully not proud at the same time. In COVID times, pride can make us think we're more important than other people, especially if we're all bunched up together and humanity kind of goes towards hierarchy. So we start to uh, try and assert ourselves maybe. Um, 
it raises questions about um, in this pandemic, whether a young life is worth more than an old one. I've heard conversations like that. Uh, some people thinking that the fact that it's old people are dying is kind of okay uh, because they're going to die anyway. But that displays a certain hubris within the always young people who are having that conversation. Um, should we ignore the restrictions just because they don't apply to us? And we've seen an awful lot of that. That's actually pride, thinking that somehow we're different, we're distinct. Um, do we think we deserve more than others, more facility uh, or more attention in, in any way? Uh, and is there an Indra within us that is disturbed that we're not the center of attention? That's a, uh, a joke I heard about the fellow who heard that the scientists had found the center of the universe and got very upset because it wasn't him. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so do, do, we, do we create in our families, in our relationships, in our communities, raging storms? Are we responsible for um, hailstorms of emotion and typhoons of resentment uh, based on some issue of pride, some standing on an issue that really isn't worth standing on because it's not, it's not who we are? So the pride separates us from these things. And then I will read the second half of this. Uh -huh. Second half of this story. Um, so everything stopped. Indra, his conceit now gone, like the clouds that had blocked the sun, was able to see clearly again. My mother heard him apologize for being so foolish and said he praised, and she said he praised Krishna for being so kind to restore his vision. What a wonderful way to do it. You couldn't make that up. This little boy truly was the Lord of the mountain, Giriraj, and the Lord of Indra too. With one awesome act, he not only locked down the world of Raj and thereby saved us from destruction, he rescued Indra from his pride, allowed us all an extended group hug, intensified our love for him put Govard on at center stage again and reminded us once more that a crisis is a chance to run to Krishna, who always has a plan. The story ends with another smile. Krishna was happy to have released the great ruler of the heavens from the intoxication of power. It took a lockdown under a mountain and seven days of venting for Indra to come to his senses. Govardhan Hill still stands. May I always shelter under his slopes and may Indra's pride never puff up again. So, and then looking at, at that, um, is there two? Uh, for the devotee who's reading that, crisis means Krishna. So that's what Krishna is saying about this, this life crisis where there's this lockdown. You have to give up the normal course of life. You have to all come together in that situation and do the same thing. And outside is just mayhem. In terms of coronavirus, outside is threatening. And being with other people is threatening. So when you're in a crisis, that's also Krishna. When you're in a joyful situation, you know, when you go to the temple, church, or mosque, you're praying for something joyful, generally. Uh, and when you get the joyful thing, you say, oh, thank you, God, and everything. When the horrible thing happens, then where do you go? And Krishna's saying, oh, come here. I'm still here. I'll still protect you. It doesn't mean there won't be horrible things, but you can, you can be protected because actually we're all under lockdown to some extent in our heads, in our emotions, in our lives. And we're under the lockdown of uh, the desire for success, the desire for happiness without um, a little bit of suffering. When the, when the suffering comes, we're like surprised. <laughs> um, and how to be liberated from these mental lockdowns that we've decided this is how life is, this is how life has to be. And if it's not like that, that's a source of great distress for us. So Krishna is saying, no, forget about that. See me everywhere. Goodness is everywhere. Love is everywhere. Protection is everywhere. 
you don't have to worry about these things. Um, so, but to release ourselves from the worry, we have to release ourselves in as much as we would jump into our father or mother's arms in the swimming pool uh, with the hope that they will catch us. And that's a real release. So Krishna is saying that this happiness doesn't, doesn't depend on the external circumstance. The external circumstance could be a sunny day or an awful storm, but it doesn't mean that you can't be uh, stable inside and therefore always in a position to share love like Krishna did with the community in Vrindavan where he protected them and he loved him without any question, without any thought of something back for himself. Um, and then we can, um, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it at that. And then the final story. What is the time? Oh, time is good. Okay. Final story is um, the story of Kalia. Hands up all who know the story of Kalia. A few hands, not very many. Oh, goodness gracious. Okay. It's in the Srimad Bhagavatam, but I'm taking it from the Hari Vamsa. A lot of these stories are told in different texts, and um, it's the same story told over and over again. Uh, so that some of them are very old and obviously very popular. Kalia is a very interesting story. Um, I'll tell it a little bit more. Um, Kalia lived in Ramanaka Lake in the ocean, and Kalia was a snake of all things, and he had many heads, and he had many wives who were also snakes. And uh, Anuradha's story um, about Kalia is told from the perspective of one of his wives. Kalia was um, a very big, powerful snake that everyone, he had a lot of snake followers. And Garuda, Vishnu's order, Vishnu's carrier, was a, was a huge eagle. He was come, uh, every year and the community would give him an offering to, so that he'd go away because uh, big eagles eat snakes. So uh, this was the arrangement, but Kalia got upset with this and in his hubris, he decided to take the offering. So he took the offering for himself and Garuda found out about this and he attacked Kalia and there was a battle. And Kalia went to bite him and Garuda with his huge wing gave him a slap that sent him flying out into the ocean. And then he chased him. So Kalia was chased all over the place and ended up in the Yamuna River in Braj, in the land of Krishna. And he went to the Yamuna River because a sage had cursed Garuda that he could never stay near that river. So it was the only place that Kalia could take shelter. So he went into that river and found a, a lake in the river and set up shop. And because he was a poisonous snake, I think actually this is, yes. So let, let the first couple of paragraphs, I'll read these to give you an idea of what happened in this river because of Kalia. Kalia was out of place in the Yamuna. He didn't think so, but this place belonged to Krishna and we should not have settled there. This is the voice of his wife. His angry and envious nature didn't suit the tranquil climate. The once clear, calm lake a source of refreshment and enjoyment for all now appeared like a dark, low-lying cloud. Along its banks, snake holes appeared, blazing with fire from the mouths of Kalia's servants. Toxic fumes spewed everywhere. Birds passing overhead dropped dead from the sky. Droplets of poison carried on the breeze spread out from the water across the land, killing animals and vegetation far and wide. Kalia's anger was a force unchecked, and caused a crisis unprecedented in the land of gentle cowherd people living near the lake. No one expected this. No one was ready for it. Such a pollution had never before entered the disease-free land of Vrindavan, but such contamination could not endure. So we see that this pollution was unexpected. It came out of nowhere, much like coronavirus. The um, the anger of Kalia, his uncontrolled anger, was endemic, like a virus, because this coronavirus now, scientists are saying, is endemic. This will more than likely be always with us. So this was um, Kalia's 
problem. But it's not only Kalia's anger that's endemic, all anger is endemic. All anger is constantly there. Uh, and it's like like a virus, like a sickness, like a pandemic, like a plague. It's just there and it causes destruction. It poisons the atmosphere as Kalia's poison did. Um, and it poisons the atmosphere of relationships, of families, of communities, of countries. When countries go to war together, when countries develop resentment, anger and bitterness towards each other based on what exactly? And people actually forget. They just know that we hate those people because they've got slanty eyes or because like uh, Trijatu is a Rakshasa. So all Rakshasas are bad. Uh, in America now, all Democrats are bad or all Republicans are bad. Things have become so polarized and people get tremendously angry and they become violently angry and there's no rhyme or reason to it. It doesn't just make any sense logically, politically, economically. There's no sense to it. Once you become angry, you lose intelligence. You lose your ability to discriminate. And Kalia was like that. And in the story, his wife was very concerned about him. What, what could she do with him in this situation? So this anger is a pestilence, a virus that can destroy lives um, and destroy families. And to defeat it, um, we have to recognize the Kaliya within ourselves. Um, because anger and envy and bitterness and resentment are toxic and the toxins build up in the body and then cause tremendous disease and failure of organs, etc. Um, they kill, on a more subtle level, consideration for others. It, all, it becomes all about that. It kills kindness and the capacity for kindness. It kills compassion and joy and harmony and peace. And it, it creates in us toxic thought. And looking at the story of Kalia, you're thinking, well, he's a multi-headed snake. Why should I take this story seriously? But the analysis of his mentality is very interesting. And when we analyze his mentality and look at it from a psychological perspective, then we can think of our, our own mentality like that and superimpose this image on it, a multi-headed snake. That this is this is how it turns out in the end. It's actually dangerous. Um, it creates toxic thought, contaminates our understanding, contaminates our judgment. We make bad decisions and choices. We behave in ways that cause disturbance and dis-ease to others. Um, so yeah, so there are some of the considerations um, from Kalia. And the final reading that we will have today, uh, this is the end of the Kalia story. The wife says, I should have known my husband could never contaminate a place like Brindavan, wherein this lake sits as a jewel. This was unsustainable. This was Krishna's land where love is churned like milk to butter and spread lavishly around. No toxic thought or act could even threaten this protected environment. Oh. And just to tell you what happened when he was after the first bit of reading, Krishna came to the lake, this seven year old kid, and jumped into the middle of the toxic lake. And everyone went, Oh no. And oh, actually, he was a little older than seven at the time. I think he was about 10. Anyway, he, um, he confronted Kalia, who went to bite him, and Krishna jumped on his head and continued to jump on all his heads as every head went to strike him. And he performed this very beautiful dance. And he just kept on dancing on his head. And Kalia was full of anger. He was getting more angry and more venomous. And he was just fire shooting out of his mouth with anger. And Krishna just kept on dancing on his head. And there's some beautiful paintings and bronze murtis of Krishna in this wonderful dancing pose where his leg is up and underneath him is a, a snake's head, just to exemplify this. But he danced and danced and danced again until Kalia just ran out of steam. He just couldn't continue on. So this is um, the, the wife. Kalia did change after that and remained changed. We returned home to Ramanaka with a guarantee of safety from Garuda. Krishna knew his eagle carrier would never touch a snake marked with his footprints. 
The whole story seems like a dream now, as though we had never left this island. I'm so grateful we did. Many happy outcomes were achieved by Krishna drawing us all into his awesome play. Now we have something worth remembering and retelling forever. Some say this story of Kaliya unfolded to protect the residents of Vrindavan from pollution by way of a vaccine of love. Fear of losing Krishna, their heart's best friend, certainly churned up waves of loving feelings for him within all who watched the drama in the lake. Absorbed in thoughts of him, nothing else could touch them. Others say it was all about the dance at the end. Krishna wanted to impress the cowherd girls already in love with him, with his skillful dance moves. Who knows? We do know, however, there has never been a more marvellous sight than a smiling Krishna poised and balanced atop a writhing serpent's head, setting the whole world to rights with the tap of his dancing feet. And that's kind of looking at, at the end of it. Um, so Kalia couldn't be defeated because of his anger. No one could go up against him. Garuda chased him down. He found shelter, but he couldn't defeat Krishna because he couldn't defeat love. Anger doesn't defeat love. And in this story, the whole point is that love defeats anger. And how does love defeat anger? Well, look at the story. Krishna danced on Kaliya's head. In the story, it says it got to the stage that with Krishna's dancing, Kaliya began to vomit uh, blood. He became so distressed physically, mentally, everything. He was just totally worn down. But Kaliya is like um, any addict. He was addicted to his anger. To his negative emotion and um, I don't know if uh, I come from Ireland where we have a lot of alcoholics uh, I have three in my family that I know about um, and how do you deal with an alcoholic and sometimes the love is that you have to be seemingly unkind but that is the kindness you have to um, reject them until they choose you, you just have to tell them I, I can't relate to you if you're going to relate to me like that you know, that, that, that's, it's the love is that you have to change now. And I saw it with my brother, uh, a, a rift became between him and his wife. She wasn't divorcing him or anything like that, but she walked out of the house and took her child with her and said, now you have to deal with this. And that's, that's what changed him. That's what convinced him that he had to change. And up to that point, she was an enabler in the fact that she put up with it. And that's, it's not only the easiest thing for us to do, it's, it's a gradual process of decline when we become angry and resentful and bitter. And it builds up, it is toxic and it builds up in our system where we become more angry and more bitter. So it's difficult to deal with, it's difficult to know when to call it. But kindness and love in that situation means that we have to call it and we have to deal with it appropriately. Krishna dealt with um, Kaliya appropriately. He didn't kill him. He helped him. He helped him resolve his issue to face his anger and give it up. So we all can extend that love to someone. It's possible for us all to help someone that we know who is suffering from anger and uh, envy and pride like Indra. And as I said, when we look in the mirror in the morning, we can start right there, helping the addict, the uh, pride, anger addict, by uh, helping them understand how they're going to act that day and how they're going to act with kindness and affection for others rather than resentment or bitterness or, or pride. Um, and yes, so if we look at Sita's story, Sita was isolated, but she, someone reached out to her, totally, you couldn't say that a Rakshasa would be kind, it's just against type, but there are no types, there are only individuals. So it was, that's, that story breaks down that barrier that like in the American context we were talking about, there are Democrats and Republicans and I don't like Democrats, but there aren't Democrats, there's just people. And they might support Democrat, they might support Arsenal, they might support you know, I don't know, the Labour Party. Uh, that's got nothing to do with their ability to be kind or not. That's a much deeper 
reservoir. And we all have the ability to be kind. And we all can expect kindness from others at some time in our life. And like Sita, we have to be able to accept that kindness, no matter from what source it comes, from whatever caste, creed, or religion, or gender, or race, or species, even if the kindness comes from our dog who comes to lick us in the face. Um, accept that kindness. That's kindness. That's love. That's affection as well. We're not speciesist. Um, and then we have to look out for these toxins every day. Look out for them in our daily lives as they come out in our life, rather than looking at other people's toxins. Very easy to see other people's toxins and comment on them in a learned way. But actually, it's much more difficult to recognize them in ourselves, um, particularly because of pride. We can get very angry. We can get violent. We can kill people because of our pride, which actually blocks our ability to see fault within ourselves. So it's very important that we um, deal with these toxins. Um, and, and these toxins are a virus in our life. And the vaccine is love. And love is a two-way street. It's, a rela it's based on relationship. Love doesn't mean anything without two people involved. So it means to love and to be loved. And the Vedas, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Harivamsa, all the Vedic texts, they all talk about um, the idea of uh, love and being loved. But first you love and then you accept love. You always give love first. There's an, an, an element of unreservedness about it. You don't wait for someone else to act first. You act. And even if you don't get something back, you've still done a good thing. It's, it's fine. And we're all looking for protection. And in these stories, Krishna or Ram, they're offering protection. They're offering you to meditate that they are present in every circumstance. So even if there's a lockdown, even if we're going through this very difficult time at a global level, this is just another difficult time at a global level. There have always been difficult times. This is just the pandemic that we're going through now. And there's going to be another thing in four years from now. There was the financial crisis. Uh, there's always something going on in someone's life or in some community or some tsunami or something. So we roll with the punches. I did hear someone um, uh, give the analysis that we've spent over 200 years in our industrial revolution exploiting the planet at a rate that has never happened before in history. So we've exploited and abused and trampled uh, in a very selfish way. Um, and then after 250 years, which in the light of the expanse of time on this planet is really nothing, then the planet who's called in Sanskrit Bhumi, it's in, the planet is represented as a person, a lady, and um, a mother, in fact, always called Mother Bhumi, so how do you treat your mother? Uh, and Bhumi responds by sending the smallest of her soldiers, a tiny virus that we can't even see, that within weeks brings down the whole edifice, calls into question our whole economic model, our whole political model, our whole idea of uh, world interconnectivity, the whole idea of technology and how it's sustainable or not sustainable. So it's just, and it's just an interesting observation that someone made, um, whether Bumi is standing there doing that or not. But it is interesting that um, in the uh, Bhagavad Purana and the Atharva Veda, these are the only texts that we have where Mother Earth is given a voice, where she actually speaks about what she thinks about how people treat her. And it's not, it's not pretty. <laughs> it's, not, it's not pleasant. Um, and it's also interesting that many of the avatars are called to come to Earth by Mother Bhumi. Uh, she comes to them and declares that you need to come because things are out of control. And generally, it's, it's about how she's being treated. So three things to remember. Stay at home with your family, with your relationships, with those that you love. Um, whether we're in this lockdown or another lockdown, save lives, which means don't waste your life with anger and pride and envy, and don't mess up other people's lives, and save the NHS, save our natural healthy spirit.
if you have any other twist on NHS, I'm open to suggestions. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.